Nutrition is the building blocks of our bodies and our immune systems. So I think it's important for neuroendocrine tumor patients to understand that they may have to make changes to adapt to their disease as far as their intake of nutrition. So the first part of the question is what would be a healthy eating pattern for somebody with carcinoid syndrome? And in general, that would be the same thing for any of us uh, or any other person without carcinoid syndrome. It would be a diet that's primarily plant-based, a diet that does not have a lot of saturated fat. If you had to put a number to it, one would want to keep the saturated fat amount less than 7%, but other fats can be used that are good, like monounsaturated fatty acids. It would be a diet that's relatively high in fiber, perhaps as high as 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day. It would be a diet that not only has a lot of plants, but contains those plants which are called pulses. And pulses are lentils, beans, peas, they can be nuts, and these are very healthy types of foods. The types of fruits that can be used might be berries, which are rich in antioxidants and other beneficial phytochemicals, fruits that are high in fiber. Fiber comes in two types. They are soluble fibers, which are fibers that are absorbed by the body, and insoluble fibers. And these are the fibers that build up the structure of fruits and vegetables. In patients with diarrhea and malabsorption problems, soluble fibers need to be increased because they help with absorption of water in the colon area and are easier for patients uh, to digest. Insoluble fibers, which are used typically in higher amounts, are not tolerated well and they increase the transit time, thus increasing the diarrhea symptoms. Healthy eating, it contains properties that involve protein, protein that is not necessarily associated with lots of saturated fat, various forms of carbohydrate, not necessarily processed starches and sugars, but natural forms of carbohydrate, those that contain high amounts of fiber, and healthy fats, those that contain various forms of unsaturated or monounsaturated or omega-3 polyunsaturated fats. So those are the general principles of healthy eating for all people, and they would be applicable to those with carcinoid. So in patients who have symptomatic carcinoid syndrome or even symptomatic neuroendocrine tumors where there, is, where there are high amounts of bioactive amines, for instance, then that healthy eating diet is modified so that it does not contain other amines, or at least it's a diet that's not high in certain amines. Now the best example of that would be a diet that's relatively low in foods that contain tyramine. So foods that are relatively high in tyramine that should be avoided or at least kept to a minimum would be those that have a lot of nuts, for instance, such as walnuts or Brazil nuts, uh, not eating so much chocolate, teas, not having cured meats, not having hard cheeses, for instance. So these are foods that are relatively high in tyramine, and they can worsen some of the symptoms that are seen with carcinoid syndrome. Also, there are beverages that patients may need to avoid, including alcohol and uh, concentrated sweets, as well as drinks that have caffeine connected with them, such as coffees and tea. Patients with carcinoid syndrome tend to have more symptoms if they eat a very large meal. So smaller meals tend to be associated with less symptoms. So there are studies looking at various factors, various components of eating patterns and eating behavior associated with the severity or extent, not necessarily the type or the quality, but the severity of symptoms with carcinoid syndrome. Involuntary weight loss is a big problem among patients uh, that are having uh, have neuroendocrine tumors related to malabsorption or surgeries and is uh, an issue that can change their outcomes. Patients with carcinoid syndrome should understand that there may be times when they become very sick 
and when they do become very sick, principles of healthy eating and therapeutic di diets simply aren't going to apply. In those situations, they may require nutrition support. But patients should be cautioned not to consume foods that are high in serotonin, which could falsely elevate or, or adversely elevate levels of 5-HIAA that could be measured as a marker of their disease. So this should be coordinated with their physicians and coordinated with their physician visits. In patients with carcinoid or carcinoid syndrome who have had various types of therapies, and those therapies no doubt are going to be affecting their gastrointestinal tract, then the way in which they eat needs to be uh, a manner or, or a pattern that doesn't make their symptoms worse. So for instance, if they've had surgery and they're at risk for obstruction or if they have problems with motility, then having a diet that's softer, maybe with potato and bread, some rice, foods that are more easily digested than other foods that are harder, uh, can obstruct foods that are perhaps even much higher in fiber that can cause symptoms, cause gas. These are things that, that can be modified. Supplements many times are misinterpreted. The supplements that increase calories and proteins, such as enteral feedings, um, are many times used to increase protein and calories in diets, and these are used in practice. And those supplements could be various drinks, various uh, complete meals that come in prepackaged formats that are commercially available. They may also have specific deficiency or insufficiency states for micronutrients. For instance, they may have deficiencies in fat-soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, or K. And they could also have deficiencies in calcium, in folic acid, other B-complex nutrients. So what I would recommend is that in discussion with the physician and then certainly following an appropriate nutritional evaluation, if and only if a various, one of the various micronutrient deficiencies is found, then supplementation can be recommended. Uh, just because it says natural does not mean it is safe and that is very important for uh, patients to understand. Some of these supplements can increase your bleeding time, they can decrease the absorption of chemotherapy drugs, they can interfere with other medications that a patient may be taken. So these products need to be um, discussed with a physician or clinician to decide what they will be allowed to use and what they should truly avoid. If you wanted to really consider the approach, the nutritional approach to a patient with carcinoid, the first prong would be healthy eating. The second prong would be avoiding components in foods that can worsen the symptoms of carcinoid, such as those foods containing high tyramine. And the third prong would be finding a, a nutritional program or an eating pattern which was optimized for the type of therapy that patient had. Also, I think that it's very important to have them understand the importance of the intake of foods that are high in protein and nutrients from the natural sources and not to believe that there is one supplement or something that they can buy in a bottle that is going to make them better. The eating pattern is individualized for patients with carcinoid syndrome. And in fact, this is a principle that we apply to all fields of medicine nowadays, not only because of the innovation and the advent of new genetic and genomic diagnostics and therapeutics, but just our understanding that human beings are all different. We have different behaviors. We have different preferences. So you, you can't, as a physician, recommend a certain eating pattern to one person and expect that that eating pattern is going to be adhered to even for another person with the exact same disease. In all manners of medical intervention, 
patients who are in a better nutritional status, they have better nutritional health, tend to do better. So it is a component, and in fact it's a necessary component of all forms of medical care.